Welcome to more course introduction to proteogenomics. From the last lecture Dr. Kelly Ruggles provided you an overview of genomics and genomic technologies, how they are making revolutions for various diseases especially in context of cancer. Today is going to be second lecture by Dr. Kelly Ruggles and she will talk to you about sequence alignments with respect to the reference genome. Also what are the terminologies like coverage and depth refers in terms of alignment of genes to the reference genome. She will talk to you about exome and whole genome sequencing, how it helps to understand the genome and different variations like copy number variants and mutation status which may lead to various clinical conditions. The lecture will also describe about various type of SNPs, SNP arrays and applications of GWAS or genome wide association studies in a population with reference to disease. She will then cover about transcriptomic fields which is going to look beyond the genome, how the transcripts are formed, how you can study RNA expression and by using the RNA sequencing data or NGS technologies and various applications how one could get some functional information just looking beyond the genome. So, let us welcome Dr. Kelly Regals for her second lecture. Okay, so we are going to just continue where we left off. Um, so, at this point I have sort of walked us through getting to the FASTQ raw data files and now we are going to talk about what we do with it once we have those data files um, for all different kinds of omics analysis. So, the first thing that we do is we have to align these, um, these sequences to a reference genome if a reference genome exists. I am going to assume for the purpose of this that we have a reference genome. Um, and so, what that means is you take the short sequences and you match it against a genome that represents um, whatever species that we are looking at. So, for example, for humans um, there is a reference genome, uh, the current updated reference genome is HG38, the, the version before this was HG19, um, a lot of things still are in HG19, some things are in HG38. This is something that if you are if you're doing an alignment or you are using data that is aligned to a genome you should definitely always check the reference genome because it will completely mess you up if you use the wrong reference genome um, and you assume it is one and it is actually uh, aligned to the other. So, um, what a reference genome is just a sequence database that acts as a representative sample of a species. Um, and so, as I mentioned for human the current version is HD38, there is a mouse version MM10, there is a whole every species that has been sequenced. Um, has a, gene, a reference genome you can look up um, if these are not including your, your favorite um, species to work with. And what the alignment does is it finds perfect matches. So, um, um, anything where that 150 or 200 base pairs uh, perfectly aligns to the genome it, or it can allow for a certain amount of mismatches. Um, and depending on the aligner and the settings you can sort of put in how much mismatch you will want to allow. And then um, if you use let us say Illumina you can get about 80 to 90 percent of the reads that to map to either a human or a mouse genome. Um, there are a lot of problems that occur you know if you have a chunk that maps to many different parts of the genome you do not know which one it came from um, and there are you can read about depending on which aligner you are using sort of the limitations um, and, and the strengths of each of the different aligners. And typically the output is what is called a SAM file which is a sequence alignment map file. I am not going to go into the details about this, it would, we could have a whole day on SAM files, but if you want to learn more I did include a reference here that is pretty thorough in terms of the SAM file format. Um, and then in, there are some common tools I mentioned two here, so Bowtie which is um, typically now used for genomic alignment and STAR which is used for RNA-seq. Um, I also included here some references if you are interested in learning more about either of those. Um, we do not have time to go through all of the details about them today, but um, I did want to mention, mention them. Has anyone used Bowtie? No. Star? 
Neither? Great, all new. So this is, that's good. <laughs> so, um, and so something to keep in mind here too is you hear a lot about coverage and depth when you, when you hear about next-gen sequencing. And what that really means is the coverage is the percent of the reference genome that you've, you were able to sequence. And then the depth is the redundancy of coverage. So how many um, reads you were able to get at a certain, on average at a certain point within the reference genome. So for example, 10x would mean 10 reads on average that you are able to cover uh, across the reference genome. Um, and the reads are the number of uniquely mapped reads here. Okay, so I wanted to go through some examples of um, next-gen sequencing methods and how they're, how they're used. So um, we'll start with genomics, then we'll move into transcriptomics, and then we'll end on epigenomics. So for genomics, um, the common, two commonly used methods are whole exome and whole genome sequencing. So um, whole genome sequencing um, just means that you're taking everything in the genome and you're sequencing all of it. Um, depending on the species you're working with, if you're working with humans, that's a lot. That's, a, that's an enormous amount to sequence. So, so if you don't care about the things that are in the intergenic or intronic regions and you just care about protein coding genes or exons, then you just want to look at the exome. And so what you can do is um, you can actually capture the exome sequences. Um, so you use these oligo probes that um, match to uh, exon sequences that are able to pull out and enrich for these um, exon sequences during the library prep. So you kind of get rid of everything that's uh, intergenic or, or um, so what you can do is you can enrich for these um, exons before you do your, while you're doing your library prep, and then you do all of the sequence amplification and sequencing following that so that you're only really looking at the exons. So you get rid of everything else, and this is 2% of the whole genome, which really cuts back on the costs quite a bit if you don't care about the other stuff. So it's, it's another method to keep to, that a lot of people use. So it's cheaper and faster. With whole genome sequencing, it's more coverage, but it's much more expensive. So depending on what you care about, um, you decide which one you want to actually do. Okay, and then so two of the main things that you can do with, um, with the genomics is to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, um, which are these single base parasites that vary. Uh, so, for example, if in your reference genome there's a, a T and in your sample there's a C, then you know that there was some sort of mutation that occurred. And some of, as I mentioned in the beginning, some of these have been shown to be drivers of tumor progression. So in cancer, these are particularly interesting. And you can also look at, look at copy number variation, which is just changes in the genome because there's a large duplication or, um, or deletion of DNA. So instead of, so you can see here, if this is along the chromosome, you see that there's this big chunk that's been duplicated here. And then if you look at the copy number level, you can actually see that there's double the number, like approximately double the copies of this area of the, of the genome that you see in your actual um, reads. So you're able to actually get information on um, these duplications and deletions using these uh, sequencing methods. There are a couple of different kinds of SNPs. Um, so let's say this at your DNA, as I mentioned, there's codons that encode for, um, for different uh, protein amino acids. So in this example, there, this is your reference genome, so you have no mutation. Um, and then it, this encodes for this RNA sequence, which then encodes for a lysine. Um, you can have a synonymous mutation where this C is turned to a T. Um, which causes the RNA to change to three A's in during um, uh, translation, and then our transcription, sorry. And then the protein, though, is still becomes a lysine because there is some overlapping um, RNA codons that encode for the same protein. So this doesn't actually cause a change at the protein level. Um, but then you can have some non-synonymous SNPs. So for example, if you change the, a, the T to an A here, um, you get a UAG at the RNA level, which encodes for a stop codon. So now you have, instead of your protein going on and um, continuing to grow, you actually have a truncated protein. Or you could have a missense SNP where you have the, the middle T uh, becomes a C, 
Um, at the RNA level, it's AGG, and then you have an arginine, so it's changed the protein. So these are the mutations that people typically focus on because they have an impact at the protein level. Um, but when we do SNP calling, you, find, you actually identify all of the mutations regardless of whether or not they're synonymous or non-synonymous. So um, there, in addition to next gen, sort of the standard next gen sequencing we were talking about, there's also SNP arrays, and these are still pretty commonly used, so I did want to talk about them a little bit. Um, and these are just, uh, they're, they're um, actual arrays that have specific SNPs that they measure. So you are only going to measure the SNPs that are on the array. When you do whole genome sequencing, you can measure whatever. It's whatever, is, whatever you find, you find. At, at, in an array, you are actually asking, do I find these SNPs and how can I measure them? At, at, at what's the quantitation of those SNPs in different um, populations? So here, you um, have your genomic DNA um, and you fragment it and then you lay it across a chip sur surface. So this is, there's a couple of different kinds of chips I just chose one of the newer ones, and then the DNA is amplified and hybridized to whatever your array is, which is here. And then it scans, and you're able to quantify how much of which of the SNPs is occurring. In this case, it's because of they have these, um, these fl floor, uh, the fluorescent labels that um, specifically hybridize to different SNPs, so you're able to actually measure which SNP is present in which sample. There's a couple of different ways you can do this, but that's essentially sort of the over, over, um, overview of how this works. And these are commonly used in these genome-wide association studies. Um, so these GWAS studies, if anyone's done like 23andMe, I don't know, any of these like sequence your own SNPs, they're done with SNP arrays. Um, so uh, what GWAS studies, they just measure and analyze these um, SNPs across different um, populations, so they're typically trying to understand, it's a case control study, so if you have a population of people with disease X and a population of people without disease X, can you find a SNP that occurs more often and it's at a statistically significant level in disease X versus the control? So, um, and uh, these were, I think, I feel like they were super popular maybe 10 years ago, people still do them, but um, they definitely were a huge deal for a little while, and there are certain cases where they're still really useful. Um, and so you can just see here, this is just looking across all the chromosomes, and it's showing that at this point um, in chromosome, I can't tell which one this is based on the color, but that there is a significant association, so this is a, log, a negative log 10 uh, p-value with the disease versus the control. And you can also use SNP arrays if you're doing like a cancer study and you just want to look at specific, specific um, SNPs in your population. It's one way of doing it. It's cheaper than doing um, the next gen sequencing. Okay, so um, another way that you can do SNP detection is just using either the whole genome or whole exome sequencing that we talked about before. So you have your whole um, your your sequencing data and you align it to the reference genome again. As, as we discussed. And then you have those quality scores, those FRED scores for each of the different reads, so you know how confident you are that the, the base that you're calling at that, at that um, specific location is true or not. And then um, you, can re, you can remove some of these reads or you, know, you do a QC step. And then depending on the number of samples, um, you can either do this multi-sample calling or a single sample calling. Um, and then you, you're, there's many algorithms that do this. I'll talk a little bit about which ones are available. So the algorithms will call different SNPs, and then it outputs um, SNP calls which, and in VCF format, which typically in VCF format, which I'll, I'll talk about what that format looks like. Oh, here we go. So this is a VCF file. Um, and what it has is information on these SNPs and where they're located. So you can see um, in cr the first column is chromosome. In the second column, it's the position of the, of the SNP. In the third column, it's an ID. Some, in this case, it's just left blank. Um, but sometimes it has information like from a different database that exists that, like Cosmic or dbSNP, which we'll talk about. Some of these have been annotated, so it will just put in whatever that SNP is. Um, 
it has the reference base, so what it is in the like RefSeq or um, whatever your or sorry in the HG19 um, database, and then um, it has whatever the allele that's that's different in your sample is, um, and then it has a quality score and it can have all sorts of columns that go on and on that talk about what it is. So it depends on the data, but the six the first six are always there and they're the most um, important. So um, there was a paper, there's a, a um, paper that came out in 2018 that reviewed um, some of these variant calling pipelines. I've included it here. So again, the general steps for all of these um, algorithms are to al align the, to the genome reference, um, do this recalibration and QC step, then do the variant calling and, and look at the quality of those and then filter out the variants based on the quality um, that they come up in your in your variant caller. So there's a whole bunch of pipelines. Um, everyone has a favorite. It's usually the one that they, they created or that they know the person who created it. That's how these things work, right? Um, but a lot of people, what they do is they use several of them and then they look for overlaps. And that seems to be the best way of doing this because um, you know that if many of them, all of them have different strengths and limitations and then you know if it was called by several, then the overlap is probably the best, um, the best way to go. And then there's several SNP databases that are really useful if you're working with these SNPs. So for example, there's dbSNP, which is just a collection of every SNP essentially that's been identified. Yeah, explain variant calling, is that what you said? Yeah, so what it is is essentially it's, it's taking your chunk of sequence and you're, it's, it's comparing it to the reference and then it's saying this, this nucleotide always comes up different in a whole bunch of reads, this one nucleotide. And it will, it will pull out the fact that that nucleotide's different in a whole bunch of reads. And then it gives it a quality score. So it will, it will output that information. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of SNP databases. Um, dbSNP, which I mentioned, is just a collection of all, all a bunch of SNPs that have been identified. Cosmic, which is specific for somatic mutations in cancer. So if you're working with cancer, this is a really a, a good one to look at. Open SNP, where you can actually upload your SNP data. I can't believe people do this. Apparently people do this. Um, they get their SNP data from these companies and then they upload it so that other people can use it. They're very trusting. Um, this um, ISGR, which was started as the Thousand Genomes Project. Has anyone heard about the Thousand Genomes, Genomes Project? Great. It's pretty interesting, and I think it's a, they keep adding more and more data, so it's really useful um, if, you're, if you're looking at um, SNPs in different populations. They're just trying to get um, DNA from people all over the world um, to try and see what SNPs occur in different populations. And then there's GoExome, which is a SNP database from um, a lung, heart, and blood disorder uh, project. Okay. And then copy number variation, as I mentioned, is just looking at these changes in the genome due to these duplication or deletions of large regions of DNA. And this is also really um, often occurs in cancer, so it's something that we, we pay a lot of attention to and use whole genome or whole exome sequencing to get information on. We were doing, you know, uh, that uh, um, CNV, we were, we were looking for CNV. But after that, we changed and we are not looking at CNV. So you think that CNV is like less popular now? I'm asking you. Like, I mean, I, we, I, all of the projects I've worked on, we still do it, and we still do include it in our data analysis. I think also if you're doing, you know, if you're doing the whole genome or the whole exome sequencing already to get your SNPs, then why not do copy number? But so I think it's also like if you already have the data, you're gonna you're gonna do it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to um, transcriptomics. So the um, the old way of doing high throughput transcriptomics was using microarrays. So these are gene expression arrays where, um, similar to the SNP arrays, where you have a set number of genes that, or now in this case, genes that you want to measure. And um, you can then, um, you have this chip where you, you make this cDNA of your, so you take your RNA and you make a cDNA using reverse transcriptase. And then, so you're just taking your single strand and you're making it a double strand. And then you, um, 
you fragment it and you um, put it on, you, have, you label it with this fluorescence, and then you add it to this microarray, and it hybridizes, so you have probes for specific genes or transcripts in your microarray that you then measure. So you just, if you have a lot of a certain transcript, there will be a lot of things that stick to that probe, and then you can, um, and then you can measure based on how much fluorescence there is in each of the cells, um, how much transcription you have in that gene. So this is the sort of the old way, and I think there are some people who are still using this, but for the most part, um, people have moved right into RNA-seq. So I'm gonna spend some time on RNA-seq. Um, so in RNA-seq, it's similar to the whole genome and whole exome sequencing where you have your sample, you isolate your RNA, and you do a library prep like we discussed before. You load on your flow cell and you do this next-gen sequencing. In this case, the only difference is that you're measuring RNA instead of DNA. Um, and what this can be used for is gene expression. So you can look for expression of genes in, um, in transcripts in all of your samples. You can do differential expression analysis, and you can also look at alternative splicing. So with RNA, right, you're going to get anything, the, you're going to get splicing um, of different exons that you're going to be able to see because at the genome level, the exons are separated by introns, and then um, once they're transcribed, you can get them and you can see what they look like um, at the once they have the alternative splicing has occurred. So that's a that's a benefit to RNA seq that you get more information than you would get from your genome sequencing. Um, some people also do do SNP calling from RNA seq um, from. I've talked to a lot of people about this, and it's, it's, there's a higher error rate, so there's some worries about using RNA-seq to do SNP calling, but it's something that people do do. So um, how does this work? So um, you actually have to enrich your RNAs um, when you do this. So you have your sample of interest. You isolate your RNAs by either using a poly, um, poly A enrichment, so you pull them out of your sample, or you can um, deplete ribosomal RNA. Those are the two different methods you can use. So you get this um, enrichment of, R of mRNAs. Then you select for specific sizes from, this, um, from the RNAs that you've enriched for, and you add the adapters, similar to what we did, I showed previously with um, genomic sequencing, and then you just do the next-gen sequencing as we, as we sort of discussed. And this, again, a lot of times is done using uh, Illumina or similar instruments. And there's a lot of applications um, for RNA-seq. I think we've all, if you're in the field at all, you've read a lot of papers where people use RNA-seq. It's very popular right now. Um, you can look for um, uh, fusion transcripts, which we'll talk a little bit about, mutations. Um, the TCGA, which I'll talk about more later, has um, used RNA-seq to characterize um, thousands of tumors. ENCODE, which I'll also talk about, has also characterized dozens of cell lines. You can look at um, annotation of genomes, so how the genomes are actually structured. And then you can identify um, I RNAs that are associated with disease. You can also look at microRNAs. That takes a totally different process of sample prep, but it's the same once you kind of isolate that microRNAs, you can sequence them and, and look similarly at how they're expressed in different uh, diseases. So today's lecture, you have learned how sequence alignment could be done and factors which help in increasing the efficiency of your analysis for the big data sets obtained from genome data sets. You also learned about GVAS which contains experimental data related to SNPs in various genes leading to different clinical conditions. Dr. Kelly has also helped us to understand how to use the raw files of NGS in SNP data analysis. And I hope you have also learnt about various SNP databases like COSMIC which contains somatic mutations in human cancer, GoExome which is SNP database for lung, heart and blood disorders and many more. So I hope you know by uh, understanding, by listening to these lectures not only you are getting refreshed 
about the genomic and transcriptomic and basic of these technologies, but also some of the databases and resources which are available from where you can obtain lot of new information from the publicly available data sets. In next lecture, Dr. Kelly will talk to you about how one could use RNA sequencing for transcriptomic studies and interpretation of data for much more meaningful insights of a given disease. Thank you.